am beyond honored to introduce John Feinstein today. This afternoon, he is here to discuss his 36th book, The Legends Club. But little does he know, he's a legend to me. I mean, come on, 36 books, and he has been inducted into the U.S. Basketball Writers Hall of Fame in 2000, the National Sports Writer and Sportscasters Hall of Fame in 2011, and the Nasmith Basketball Hall of Fame in 2013. Legend, I tell you. Legends Club dropped right in time for March Madness, which was coincidentally the ideal time for a book release about college basketball. March Madness is a wonderful time of year. It's a tournament of 68 college basketball teams in which all teams battle in a do sudden death situation. But it's just, <clears throat> it's just not a tournament, it's a phenomenon, a rivalry. Across America for four weeks, previously unknown teenagers become the household names. Grown men will cry, and over $1 billion in illegal gambling money will change hands. Welcome to the most exciting event in all of sport. Who will win the tournament becomes the dominant topic of conversation across the, across the country until the game begins. Ergo, the Legends Club. The legends are right there in the title. Dean Smith, Coach K, Jimmy V, and an epic college basketball rivalry. John's inside story of college basketball's fiercest rivalry and his inside access to all three coaches gives the, uh, the reader an eye-opening, sensational, and intimate portrayal of this intense rivalry that lasted over a decade on and off the court. On the pages throughout the Legends Club, one can witness March Madness and college basketball coming together to reveal the best and the worst of the game. This is a great book for all college basketball fans, even this Notre Dame fan. John is the author of Season on the Brink, A Good Walk, a good walk Spoiled, both number one New York Best Time Sellers, and The Last Shot, which won the Edgar Allan Poe Award for the mystery writing in the young adult category. He currently writes for the Washington Post and the Golf Digest and is a regular contributor to the Golf Channel, Comcast Sports, Regional Networks, and he hosts a college basketball show and a golf show on Sirius XM Radio. He lives in Potomac with his wife, and he is the father of three children. Please help me welcome John Fine. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. Uh, and uh, let me echo what Laura said. Please buy books. And, as she mentioned, I do have three children, uh, not to mention two cats. Um, but it's great to be back at the Gaithersburg Book Festival. I think this is the fourth or fourth time I'm getting a, a hand signal. See, I need hand signals to, to get through this stuff. Fourth time I've, I've been here. Uh, the only other person I can remember inviting me back any place four times was my ex-wife's lawyer. Um, <laughs> So it's very nice to, to be asked to come back here uh, again. As Laura mentioned, um, my, my new book is The Legends Club. I will make one suggestion, though, to you, Laura, and to the other organizers. Uh, next year, can we have this during the spring, not the winter? Um, so the weather might be a little bit warmer. I mean, my God, somebody forgot to tell God that it's May. Uh, but uh, The Legends Club, as, as Laura said, is the 36th book I've done, and it's one that is probably about as close to my heart as any that I've written. I'm, I'm often asked, what, of, of the books you've done, what's your favorite? And it's hard to, to it's sort of like being asked who your favorite kid is. Um, but it, it, I can narrow it down. I wrote a book 20 years ago called The Civil War that was about the Army-Navy football rivalry. And I'm still very close to many of those men. I, I, I've called them kids for years, but now they're in their 40s, so I don't think I can call them kids anymore, uh, who I got to know writing that book. Uh, I also wrote a book called The Last Amateurs. It was about basketball in the Patriot League. Uh, and interestingly, one of the three coaches uh, in the Legends Club, Mike Krzyzewski, began his career, coaching career, head coaching career at Army, which is where he went to school, and Army is part of the Patriot League. And the kids' books that I've written have been especially fun because my two older children, Danny and Bridget, uh, have been my editors, more or less. Uh, they try to keep me from sounding like, as they would say, a dork, uh, when the teenage characters, who are the heroes of the books, uh, are talking to one another. I, I still remember a couple of years ago, I, I had a, in, in one of the, I think it was in Last Shot, actually, which was the first of the books in, that Laura mentioned, uh, I had a conver a, a, an I am conversation between the two heroes. And I wrote, are you going, at one point, A-R-E-Y-O-U, going? And my son Danny said, Dad, 
Please, nobody writes that. Don't embarrass me. It's the letter R, the letter U. So I learned as, as I went from my kids, and, and that's been tremendous fun. But The Legends Club, I've said several times, is a book I wasn't necessarily born to write, but I lived it. Uh, I was covering the ACC for the Washington Post in the 1980s uh, when Mike Krzyzewski and Jim Valvano arrived in the state of North Carolina, nine days apart. Uh, Krzyzewski was hired on March 18th of 1980 to coach Duke, and Valvano, nine days later, was hired at North Carolina State. Mike had been coaching at Army, uh, which is West Point, New York, and Valvano had been coaching in Westchester County at Iona. Uh, he liked to tell the story that when he got the, first got the job at Iona, he was so excited, he was at a party, uh, and he'd just gotten hired, and he was going around introducing himself to people. And he'd go up and he'd go, hi, I'm Jim Valvano, I own a college. I'm Jim Valvano, I own a college. And this woman finally came up to him and said, aren't you a little young to own your own college? But he'd been at Iona for five years and it had huge success. And Krzyzewski had been at Army for five years and it had mixed success. Uh, a couple good years, but his last year at Army, he was 9 and 17, which was kind of an issue for Tom Butters, the Duke athletic director, when he started thinking about the possibility of hiring this 33-year-old coach who had just gone 9-17 and 17 at Army. And this was Duke. And Duke had just been to the Final Four two years earlier, had lost in the national championship game to Kentucky. And that year, they actually went to the Elite Eight, 1980, and lost in the regional final to Purdue. So they're a big-time program. And, she, and Butters is being told that he should hire this 33-year-old coach who just gone 9-17 and 17 at Army. So uh, there's one myth. There are a number of myths that I wanted to attack when I, when I wrote this book. And one of them was that Bob Knight, who, of course, played a major role in my life because he was the subject of my first book, Season on the Brink, uh, which I wrote when I was 12, by the way. Um, <laughs> but the, the myth is that Knight got Krzyzewski the Duke job. In fact, I think Knight to this day, because he's a pathological liar, uh, believes that he got Krzyzewski the Duke job. That's not the way it happened. The way it happened was that there was an associate athletic director at Duke named Steve Sendak, who'd been a very good player on Duke's uh, teams in the 1960s, including the 1966 team that played in the famous Final Four nearby here in College Park. Most people remember that Final Four for the Kentucky-Texas Western game that eventually became the basis for the movie Glory Road. Five African-American starters beating all-white Kentucky to win the national championship. Duke was also in that Final Four and lost to Kentucky in the semifinals, and Steve Sendak was on that team. He was an associate AD at Duke, and when Bill Foster, the Duke coach, left to go to South Carolina, his assignment was to find a new coach. And he remembered this guy he had met a few years earlier. He had been working for Converse and living in Annapolis, and his old high school coach had said, Army's coming into play. This guy who's coaching there uh, played for Bob Knight at Army and worked for him at, at uh, Indiana for a year, and you should go and meet him. So Vicendek went, spent the day with him, watched Army play Navy that, that night, Army won, uh, and was blown away by this 28-year-old coach because of his, how much he knew about the game, how well prepared he was, the way his players responded to him. And his, his name stuck in his brain, not an easy name to stick in your brain because most people pronounce it Kurzuzuski, Kurchuski. When, in fact, when, when, uh, when Mike first got hired at Duke, Lefty Drizel, the great Maryland coach who should be in the Hall of Fame, um, said, yes, thank you. There's a column about that that I wrote in tomorrow's Washington Post. I would urge you to read it. Um, thank you. Um, but anyway, Lefty said, I just call him Mike because I can't pronounce his last name, which was probably the best way to go. But Vicendak brought Krzyzewski's name up to Butters. Tom Butters, the Duke AD. And Butters' response was very direct. Who? Because he'd never heard of him. And so Vicendak explained about seeing him work at Army and suggested he at least bring him in for an interview. Well, Butters did, and he was blown away by him. And, but he kept saying, I can't hire a coach who just went 9-17 and 17 at Army. I'm gonna, this guy's going to be competing against Dean Smith, and I'll get to what an icon Dean Smith already was in a minute. I can't just do that. So he went back and interviewed a number of other coaches. Uh, Tom Davis, who was at Boston College, 
uh, Bob Welklick, who Knight was pushing for the job, another former Knight assistant who was at Mississippi, uh, a coach named Paul Webb, who was at Old Dominion, and Bill Foster's top assistant, Bob Wenzel. So he, he decided after doing this, he still couldn't get Krzyzewski out of his mind. So he brought him in for a second interview. And during the second interview, they'd been there for about three hours, Krzyzewski finally said, Mr. Butters, what's the holdup here? And he said, the holdup is you were 9 and 17 at Army, and I can't hire you. And Krzyzewski said to Butters at that moment, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were running scared. And it's a 33-year-old nobody. And Butters said, I probably should have thrown him out of the room at that moment, but I couldn't do it. So finally, he brought in all five finalists to meet with the Athletic Council, which technically had to make the hire, although whoever Butter said he wanted, they were going to hire. And afterwards, he asked Krzyzewski and his wife, Mickey, to come back to his office again, talk to him again, finally said, thank you very much for coming, and sent them back to the airport, at which point Steve Asendak walked in, and he said, what do you think? And Butter said, I think he's the next great coach. And Butters and Vicenek said, oh, so you hired him. He said, no, I can't hire him. He's 9 and 17 at Army. And Vicenek said, if he's the next great coach, how can you not hire him? So Butters said, go back to the airport and get him. So Vicenek drove out to Raleigh-Durham Airport. Mike had just put Mickey on a, a plane to here in Washington because this is where she grew up, and their two daughters were with her parents. And so she was coming here to pick them up. Mike was supposed to fly to New York to go back to West Point. His plane hadn't left yet. Butters uh, had him paged and pulled him out of line as he was supposed to board the plane. And Butters had said, don't tell him why you're bringing him back. So he pulled him out of line and said, Tom wants to see you again. I can't repeat, because there are children here, what Krzyzewski's response was at that moment. So he took him back to, to uh, Butters' office, and Butters said, he said, I, I need to ask you one more question. He said, what? <laughs> he, said, he, he said, what question have you not asked me? And Butter said, I haven't asked you if you'll take the job. And Krzyzewski said, of course I'll take the job. And he said, don't you want to know what you're going to get paid? And Butter said, I'm, and Krzyzewski said, well, I'm sure you'll be fair. And as Krzyzewski said years later, he wasn't. He gave him, he, he, he signed him for, for five years for $40,000 a year, which even back then, just by comparison, Morgan Wooten was offered, that, that's, my math isn't very good, but that's $200,000 over five years. Morgan Wooten, who was coaching at DeMatha then, was offered the NC State job that month and turned down $800,000 for five years. So do the math. By the way, his son Joe, who coaches at O'Connell, was very disappointed because he said to his dad, he saw a headline in the Washington Post that said Wooten offered NC State job for $800,000. He said, he, Joey was eight at the time. He said, Daddy, if you take the job, can we have a swimming pool? And Morgan said, yeah, probably. He said, take it. But Morgan wanted to coach high school ball, and Valvano eventually got the job. Now, so here are some twists that occurred in all of this. Um, 24 years later, Krzyzewski was offered... $40 million for five years to coach the Los Angeles Lakers. And he called Tom Butters and he said, well, what do you think about this? And Butters said, I think you should send me a finder's fee of 10%. And Krzyzewski said, fine, I'll send you $4,000. <laughs> so the headline in the Duke Chronicle the next morning uh, was, this is not a misspelling, Krzyzewski. Nobody could believe that Tom Butters had hired this guy. In the meantime, NC State still needed a coach because Norman Sloan, who had won a national championship in 1974, had left for Florida. And he and Bill Foster left Duke and NC State, respectively, for the same reason, Dean Smith. Because even though Norman Sloan won a national championship, even though uh, Bill Foster went to a national championship game after taking over the Duke program when it was in tatters, they could not overcome the aura of Dean. Bill Foster used to say, I always thought it was Naismith that invented the game, not Dean Smith. So they both left. And Jim Valvano, when he heard that the Duke job was open, had written a letter to Tom Butters saying that he would be very interested in interviewing for the job. Well, Butters was already down the road with, with Krzyzewski at that point. 
But when Steve Ascendak read the letter, he was so impressed with it that he took it into Butters. And Butters was so impressed with it, he forwarded it to Willis Casey, who was the athletic director at NC State, who was at that point trying to hire, hire Morgan Wooten. But when Wooten didn't take the job, he called Valvano and asked Valvano if he'd be interested in the NC State job. Valvano said yes. Nine days later, he was hired. So Valvano writing to Duke ended up getting him the job at NC State. Now, both coaches talk a lot about what it was like when they first arrived. Krzyzewski always said that if Jim and I had arrived from Mars instead of from New York, we probably would not have had less understanding of what a power Dean Smith was in the state of North Carolina. We, couldn't, we, we simply didn't understand it. And each of them has a story that kind of defines that. Valvano's concern going to the campus barbershop for the first time. And he went in, and there's an old barber there, and the barber says to him, you the fellow replaced Norman Sloan? Yes, I am. Said, Boy, I sure hope you have more luck around here than old Norman did. He says, didn't Norm Sloan win a national championship? Did, didn't he go 27-0 and 0 one year? And the barber goes, yeah, he sure did, but just imagine what old Dean Smith could have done with that team. Krzyzewski uh, figured it out pretty quickly. He was uh, recruiting a, a player in California named Mark Akers. If you're a basketball geek, you might remember the name. He played in the NBA, played for the Celtics for a number of years. Good player, six foot ten. Uh, but you, the coaches will tell you there are certain recruiting visits where you get into it a little bit, and you know you're not getting the kid. But you got to go through the routine anyway. So Shishovsky's going through the whole thing, talking about the school, and finally he turns to Mrs. Akers, the mom and says, Mrs. Akers, you haven't asked me anything all night. Is there anything you need to know about Duke, about our academics, about how Mark would fit in, about our team? And she says, no, 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 I don't need to ask any questions because the only thing that's important is that Mark go to college somewhere where he'll be close to God. And Krzyzewski said, well, if he comes to Duke, God will be coaching 10 miles down the road in Chapel Hill, so you might want to think about it. He went to Oral Roberts. Uh, most people in North Carolina would have told you he'd be closer to God in Durham. Uh, so that was what they were up against. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dean Smith. Um, Dean Smith uh, was from Kansas. His father coached the first integrated high school team that competed in the Kansas High School State Championships. I mean, now, Dean was three years old in 1934 when that happened, but later when he found out, he was very proud of his dad, and he grew up with the notion that integration was just automatic. It never occurred to him in, in the, as he was growing up that there were places that were still segregated, which, of course, there were. And one of them was Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And when he arrived there as an assistant coach in 1958, he, he had been in the Air Force, had coached at the Air Force Academy for a couple of years. He actually had to serve, in addition to being an assistant coach, as the golf coach because the budget was kind of tight. He said he knew the team was in a little bit of trouble the first day of practice when he was the best player there. Um, but he got to Chapel Hill as an assistant coach under Frank McGuire in 1958 and found out very quickly that Chapel Hill, as the, with the rest of the state, uh, was still segregated in restaurants. And this bothered him. And he had joined a, a very young new church called the Binkley Baptist Church, the minister was a young minister who was still alive, uh, Dr. Robert Seymour, and the two of them talked about this and how disturbing it was. And they decided that Dean should go into a very well-known local restaurant called The Pines, which was where North Carolina's basketball team ate their pregame meals. So he would at least be known to the, the ownership and to the management when he walked in there, even though, remember, he wasn't the head coach. He wasn't a star. He wasn't Dean Smith yet. But they decided that he should go in with uh, an African-American graduate student who was in Chapel Hill, uh, who was also a member of the church. So they did. And they walked in, and nobody knew what would happen. Uh, be they could have been arrested. They could have been thrown out. They could the management could have complained to Carolina. Could have, any number of things could have happened. Uh, but instead, they served them. And that began the breaking of color lines in restaurants in Chapel Hill, and then later throughout the state of North Carolina. It was a slow process, as most people know.
But ye- it wasn't until years later that I found out that this had happened. Dean had never talked about it publicly. And in 1981, I was doing a long profile of Dean Smith for the Washington Post, and it, it took forever to get Dean to cooperate with me. Dean never wanted attention. And Mike Krzyzewski said it best, that if he could have spent his coaching career just being beamed to practice and beamed to games and never did anything in between, he would have been very happy. In fact, when they, the University of North Carolina Board of Trustees came to him in 1985 and said, we're going to name our new basketball arena after you, he said, no, no, don't do that. Name it for the players. And as I said later, that would have been an unwieldy name. Um, so kicking and screaming, it was named the Dean E. Smith Center, also known as the Dean Dome. But it had taken me forever to get him to agree to let me interview him at length. In fact, the only way he agreed to do it was I had to go to Chapel Hill on a Friday. I was covering a Duke, Maryland game on Saturday. And I drove to Chapel Hill on Friday afternoon. I met him there, and we drove together in his car to Charlotte because Carolina was playing in the old north-south double header down there, excuse me, on Friday and Saturday. And he said, you know, I got to be in the car for two and a half hours anyway, so I'll suffer and talk to you. So we drove in the car to Charlotte. The only problem was back then Dean still smoked. And it, it was February, like today. Um, so it was cold. And so we had the windows up, and I'm choking to death on the cigarette smoke. So finally he suggested we stop to get a Coke, and I said, oh, God, yes, please. But we got to Chapel Hill, and I was driving his car back to Chapel Hill. And he was going to take the team bus back the next night. And so as... as we're, we're saying goodbye. He says, now, if anything happens, if you get stopped, the registration is in the glove compartment. I said, Dean, if I get stopped in North Carolina driving Dean Smith's car, I'm going to jail. <laughs> and he said, and with your luck, it'll be an NC State fan. <laughs> I drove 52 and a 55 all the way up by 85 that afternoon. But uh, while I was researching the piece, and, and I had asked him, you know, who are the, the important people in your life who I should talk to? And he mentioned Reverend Seymour. So I went to see him, and he told me the story about what had happened in the Pines in 1958. And I went back to Dean, and I said, please tell me more about that night. Tell me what, how you felt walking in. Were you nervous? Were you scared? Were you defiant? He said, who told you that story? I said, Reverend Seymour. And he shook his head. He said, I wish he hadn't told you that story. And I said, why, Dean? That's something you should be proud of. And he looked at me, and I know this line's been repeated because I, I wrote it and I've said it many times since because it's always stuck with me. He said, John, you should never be proud of doing the right thing. You should just do the right thing. And that's the way he lived his life. That's who he was. And I wish more of us were that way, that we just did the right thing without looking for a pat on the back for it. Now, having said all that, he was as competitive as any human being I've ever met. And John Thompson tells a great story. John Thompson and he were very, very close. John was one of his assistant coaches on the 1976 Olympic team. And in fact, the U.S. basketball writers uh, started uh, a, an award last year in Dean's name to go to somebody who has done the sorts of things off the court that Dean Smith did in addition to all the winning. And we chose John as the first winner. Now, I've known John since 1977. And we have never had a conversation that did not involve profanity. Uh, most of it directed at me from him. Uh, and when I call him, he, will, he, he never answers his phone. But he always calls back, and his opening line is always, what do you want? So... I called him to tell him, I had, the, the award was my idea, so I had the honor of telling him that he had won it. And he said, what do you want? And I said, well, I want to tell you something that I hope will make you happy. And I explained about the award and that we had selected him as the first winner. And there was a long pause. And he said, this isn't fair. You've hit me in my heart. You know how I feel about Dean. He loved Dean. He genuinely loved Dean. But you might remember the two of them competed against one another in the 1982 National Championship game, one of the most famous championship games ever. Um, Michael Jordan ended up hitting the winning shot. Patrick Ewing was Georgetown center. Fred Brown threw the infamous pass to James Worthy. And John said that at the beginning of the game, he was a little bit worried about being as competitive in the game as he needed to be. Because as much as he wanted to win the national championship, 
He also wanted Dean to win the national championship because Dean hadn't won one yet. And he said early in the game, Patrick Ewing was on the free throw line. Patrick Ewing was the slowest free throw shooter I've ever seen and routinely took 13 seconds to release a free throw. Now, the rule says you're supposed to release a free throw ten, within 10 seconds of the official giving you the ball. You always see officials going like this. Raise your hand if you've ever seen that called. Okay, I've watched a million basketball games. I have never seen it called. And so John hears Dean saying to Hank Nichols, one of the great referees of all time, um, he hears him saying, now, Hank, I know he takes more than 10 seconds, but I don't want you to call it. Just let it. I know he takes more than 10 seconds. And, and John stood there and he thought, the little SOB. <laughs> He said, he said, okay, if he's going to compete like that, I'm good. And, of course, it ended up being one of the great games ever played. But that was, that was the setup when Valvano and Krzyzewski arrived. Dean Smith ha had great teams. He had not yet won a national title, but he coached the Olympic team. He'd been to six Final Fours, and here come these two young coaches walking into North Carolina. Now, for Valvano, it wasn't a big problem because, Val A, he had good players, Norm Sloan had left very good players behind, notably three kids from this area, uh, Derek Wittenberg, Sidney Lowe, and Thurl Bailey. All grew up here. Two of them played at DeMatha. Thurl played at Bladensburg High School. Uh, Krzyzewski had, a, 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 for one year, had two good players left, Gene Banks and Kenny Denard. They graduated, and he had a bare cupboard. But Valvano's personality was such that whether the team was good or not good, he could deflect it. And, and he was such a great storyteller. Now, one story he told, and to this day, I, I don't think it's true, but it's a pretty good story. It's, and, and this is why I don't think it's true. According to the story, the first year that Jim coached at NC State, North Carolina blew them out twice, beat them by 30. Now, I went and looked it up. They beat them by three and by six. But as the story goes, after the second game, an old state alumnus came up to uh, Jim and said, now coach, I know you're from the North. I know you're a Yankee. I know you don't understand about our rivalries down here, but you cannot be losing to the Tar Heels this way. And Valvano said, no, 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 I get it. Trust me, I get it. Next year, we are going to do better against Carolina. He says, no, no, coach, you don't understand. If you don't do better, we're going to kill your dog. And Valvano said, I hear you. I understand your point. I don't have a dog, but trust me, I know where you're going. So the next morning, he goes and opens up the front door to get his newspaper, and there's a basket on the front step. And under the blanket in the basket is the cutest little puppy you've ever seen. <laughs> and around the puppy's neck is a note that says, don't get too attached. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's true, but it's a good story. And Jim could take over a room like, in fact, Linnea Smith, Dean Smith's wife, said Jim didn't take over a room when he walked into it. He became the room. And it was really true. And he told a story about, I'm going to clean this up for the, a little bit for the younger people in the audience. Um, but he told a story about one night, Hank Nichols, the same ref I just mentioned, walked running down the court and he called out his name. He said, Hank, can you give me a technical foul for what I'm thinking? And Nichols said, no, Jimmy, I can't tee you up for what you're thinking. He said, good. In that case, I think you stink. <laughs> okay. Older people use your imagination. Uh, so uh, so Jim, Jim, Jim was, was the young rock star. Krzyzewski was, and he was the hare. Krzyzewski was the turtle. He's just, no offense to Maryland fans. Uh, <laughs> he was just plodding along, trying to get better players, and, but he was, whereas Valvano battled Dean with humor, Krzyzewski battled him with that Bob Knight army intensity in your face. The first time they played one another was in the old Big Four tournament, which they used to hold in November. Duke, North Carolina, North Carolina State, and Wake Forest would play two games each on the weekend, Friday, two games Friday, two games Saturday. As luck would have it, the opening game that year, because they changed every year, was Duke against North Carolina. And as I said, Krzyzewski had two pretty good players in Gene Banks and Kenny Denard. Very close game. And at the end, 
Duke's down two. Banks takes a shot. It misses. Battle for the rebound. It goes out of bounds. Duke ball under the basket. Except the clock went to zero. Now, nowadays, obviously, the officials would have gone. They would have looked at, uh, they would have looked at the replay. They would have checked the clock and, and maybe reset it. There were no tenths on the clock then either. But now it's just at zero. So Krzyzewski's arguing with the, the timekeeper that there should be a second or two left. Dean walks up and says, good game, puts his hand out. Mike turns around and says, the damn game's not over yet, Dean. I cleaned that up, too. Uh, and Dean's kind of shocked. And Roy Williams was standing there. He was the third assistant at the time. And he said, when Krzyzewski said that, he had two thoughts. One was, nobody's allowed to talk to Coach Smith this way. And two was, guy's got some guts. So Krzyzewski eventually loses the argument. The game is over. Now he turns around and, and puts his hand out. And Dean does kind of a grip and run thing because he's a little annoyed. So he kind of goes like this. And Mike holds him there, won't let him go. And he says, at least admit it was a hell of a game, Dean. And M Dean says, I'm going to remember that. And so a beautiful friendship was born. <laughs> and a couple years later, uh, three years later specifically, when Duke got good again, Krzyzewski had his first great recruiting class, key guy being Johnny Dawkins from right here in, in D.C., and now they're good, and they're playing in Cameron Indoor Stadium, and it's a tremendous game. Michael Jordan's in the game. Sam Perkins is in the game. Uh, Johnny Dawkins is in the game for Duke. Mark Gallery's in the game, who played for the Wizards later uh, for, for Duke. And at one point, Dean Smith was convinced. First of all, Dean was in a bad mood to start with. He never liked playing at Duke because he hated the Duke students. Hated them. And that night, the Duke students had behaved very badly in a game a week before against Maryland. Any of you remember Herman Veal? Yeah, okay, I don't need to go into details, but you know what happened. So they had been lectured by Terry Sanford, the Duke president, about behaving better. So they showed up that night all wearing halos on their heads. <laughs> and when Carolina came on the court, they held up signs that said, welcome honored guests. And the Blue Devil mascot presented Dean with, with uh, a dozen roses. Dean thought none of this was funny. <laughs> then, during the game, when they didn't like a call, instead of using the call we all know t fans use, they chanted, we beg to differ. <laughs> and instead of waving, waving their arms behind the, the uh, basket, they held up signs that said, please miss. <laughs> it was really a great performance. <laughs> and it was a great game. And Krzyzewski was convinced by the end of the game that the refs had given the game to Carolina. It, and, and as my friend Keith Drum, who was the columnist in, in North Carolina, wrote, uh, unless Michael Jordan was one of the refs, they were not responsible for North Carolina winning the game last night. But he was a frustrated young coach, and after the game, he accused D the ACC of having a, quote, double standard, one for Dean in Carolina and one for everybody else. Now, the irony is, of course, now here we are all these years later, and who does everybody think there's a double standard for? <laughs> you got it. But this was a long time ago in a place far, far away. And after the game, Dean was asked about two things. He was asked about the double standard comment, and he was infuriated by that. And then he was asked about the students and how they had performed. And he said, I don't pay any attention to that. Schedule says we have to come over here one time a year. So we do. And as he's walking out, I was standing in the back of the room with my friend Keith Drum, and he walks over and points his finger at me, and he says, you think they're funny. And I said, Dean, I'm sorry. They were funny tonight. And he just stormed off, stormed off. So the rivalry was pretty intense. And that, that year is what really ratcheted it up. Now, remember, NC State had won the national championship the year before. The miracle rung, the cardiac pack, the, the buzzer-beating shot when... Derek Wittenberg threw up what he, to this day, insists was a pass. Hey, he said, oh, yeah, it was a pass. And I say, oh, yeah, and you can fly to the moon with a jetpack. But that's okay. Lorenzo Charles grabs it out of the air, dunks, NC State wins the national title, and Jim's still running around the court in Albuquerque. Um, it was one of the great moments in the history of college basketball. But what in, in 84, when Duke got good again, they play another game in Chapel Hill that Carolina wins in double overtime. So now they're going to play a week later in the ACC semis. And before the game, Krzyzewski in the locker room says, now when we win today, which we're going to do because we're the better team, I don't want to see any celebrating. I don't want to see any jumping up and down or hugging. We just shake hands and walk off the court because we're the better team. So the players listen to that. And they go out, and again, it's a tremendous game. And Duke does win this time, 77-75. 
And Mark Gallery and Jay Billis both tell the story. Game ends. Buzzer goes off. Oh, we finally did it. And they turn to go walk to the handshake line. And there's Krzyzewski at midcourt hugging Johnny Dawkins. And they all said, wait a minute. We weren't supposed to be doing this. And Krzyzewski, Johnny Dawkins said, coach, I thought we weren't celebrating. And Krzyzewski said, ah, blanket. We beat Carolina. <laughs> the hell with it. So... That, that was their first big celebration over beating Carolina. Although the next day, uh, they lost to Maryland in the ACC championship game. And that was when Lefty Drizel did not say he was going to take the choke trophy and attach it to his hood and drive around North Carolina with it. What he said was, when I was younger, I would have done that. But I'm too old for that. I'm just going to go home and take a nap. But in history, everybody says Lefty said he was going to drive through the state with the trophy on his hood. He did not say that, just for the record. So as the years went by, and I'm going to take questions here in a few minutes, by the way. Uh, as the years went by, um, the rivalries ratcheted up. They were all very good. Duke eventually made the Final Four in 1986. And Carolina continued to be good. NC State continued to be good. But then came the fall of Jim Valvano. And the interesting thing is, for all the publicity that his not paying attention to the program got, the two things the NCAA ended up citing them for were players selling shoes and players selling comp tickets. That was it. That was the list. And drove Jim out of NC State. Now, he'd be the first to tell you he wasn't paying enough attention because after they won the national championship game, unlike Valvan uh, Dean and Mike, when they won their first national title, their first thought was, how do I win another? When Jim won his first national title, his first thought was, what do I do next? What's the next thing? I've done coaching. He had lived to cut down that final net, and he did it at 37. By the way, no coach under the age of 40 has won a national championship since then. And he went looking for the next thing. He went looking for the, he, he did stand-up comedy. He sold blue jeans. He did the CBS Morning News. He would fly up Sunday night to New York and then fly back in the morning and get ready to coach his team. He did color on games during the season. And he, he wasn't paying enough attention to some of the kids they recruited. And that was really the big problem. But when he stopped coaching in 1990, he and Krzyzewski had become, became close because they, they weren't rivals anymore. They weren't competing anymore. Jim was doing TV, and when he would come in to do games, he and Mike would have long talks because Mike had been one of his defenders throughout that period at NC State had said that he was getting railroaded publicly. And so they became very close. And when Jim got sick, when Jim was diagnosed with cancer in the summer of 1992, he was being treated at Duke Hospital. And whenever he was there, initially he was in and out, in and out, uh, Mike would go visit him. And they would spend time together. And they got even closer. And then in the last few weeks when Jim was dying, after that, everybody remember the SB speech? I mean, if you haven't, go YouTube it. It's 11 of the most amazing minutes you'll ever see. And at, that was the last time Jim traveled. He was so sick that day. When he threw up all the way on the plane up to New York. He was with his wife, Pam, and Mike and Mickey Krzyzewski. And an hour before the speech, he was in his tuxedo, under the cover, shivering so badly that Pam and, and Mike and Mickey tried to talk him out of going to the speech. And he said, nope, I'm here, I'm doing it. And... For that 11 minutes, if you didn't know, you'd have never known he was sick. But he went back in the hospital not long after um, that, that speech, and Mike went and visited him every night. And Pam Valvano told me later that when Mike would walk into the room, she and her daughters would leave and would leave the two of them alone because she said for that hour or however long Mike was there, Jim didn't have cancer anymore. He was a basketball coach again. And he was talking to someone he liked and respected who was a peer. It had to be somebody like Mike. It couldn't just be, you know, a coach. It had to be a coach who Jim respected to, as a coach on his level. And there weren't very many of those. And Mike was actually in the room on the morning Jim died. It was the Valvano family and Mike Krzyzewski. That's how close they got. One other quick story about Jim and Dean. They were actually very good friends. Um... When, when Jim first came into the league, Dean had stopped going to the annual coaches slash wives dinners at the ACC meetings because he felt so much hostility from Norman Sloan, uh, from uh, Carl Tacey, from Lefty, 
uh, from a, a number of coaches, more and more Norman Sloan than anybody. And Jim went to him and said, you and Linnea need to start coming to these dinners again because you're Dean Smith. You are the coach in this league. And Dean said, well, it's not been very pleasant. And Jim said, I'll make sure it is. You and, you and Linnea sit with Pam and me, and I will make sure that you have a good time. And Linnea Smith never forgot that because she ended up becoming very close with Mickey Krzyzewski, with Ann Holland, uh, and, and with Pam Valvano because Jim made that gesture. And when, when Jim was, was dying, he had told people that one of his dreams had been to throw out a first pitch at Yankee Stadium. He didn't say bucket list because the movie wasn't made till 13 years later. But George Steinbrenner, after he saw the ESPY speech, called Jim and invited him to throw the first pitch on opening day. And Jim said, I'd be honored, Mr. Steinbrenner. I'm too sick to travel again. And Steinbrenner said, well, if you'd like to send somebody to represent you, we will introduce them that way. And Jim knew that, like him, Dean Smith was a Yankee fan. So he called Dean, and he said, would you go in my place? And Dean said he would. And again, remember, this is a guy who shunned the spotlight. And he went, and he threw out the first pitch for Jim. And Linnea Smith told me in their house, there are pictures all over of Dean with grandchildren and children and former players and coaches and friends. There's one picture in the whole house that's just Dean, and it's him throwing out that first pitch. I'll leave you with this one last story. Um, toward the end, Mike, when, when Dean was, was, was sick uh, with dementia, um, Mike Krzyzewski and Mickey went to see him at the beach, and he was, he was near the end. He was in a wheelchair, and Linnea Smith had warned them, you can come over if you want to see him, but he may not even know that you're there. And they wanted to come anyway. So Mike walked in with Mickey and was trying to talk to Dean. Again, Dean was in the wheelchair, and he kept saying, I'm so proud that you're getting the Presidential Medal of Honor. I'm so, you know, nobody deserves it more than you. And he kept talking, and Dean was just staring into space. And finally, Mike went over, and he took his hand, and he, he shook it. And he took his other hand, and he put it on his shoulder. And he leaned down, and he said, Coach, I love you. And he said, Dean looked up at him, and he smiled. And he took his left hand, and he put it on Mike's hand, and he squeezed it. And Mike said he broke down right there because it meant so much to him that there was some recognition that Dean seemed to know who he was. And I thought as I finished the book, what an amazing story about the first handshake to the last handshake and everything that happened in between among the three of them. So it's a remarkable story of, of rivalries, of friendship, and what was very gratifying to me when I read the review of this book in the Washington Post that the reviewer started it by saying, you may find it hard to believe, but the Legends Club is a love story. And in a lot of ways it was. So thank you all. I'm sorry I didn't leave more time for questions, but I'll try to squeeze a few in. Any questions? I answered everybody's questions. Yes, sir. What do I think about the four corners with Dean Smith? I think he would do whatever he had to do to win, and he had Phil Ford. Uh, but, but the delay offense had a lot to do with the clock coming in. The, in 1982, in the ACC championship game, Carolina went to the four corners and held the ball for 14 minutes against Virginia when Virginia had Ralph Sampson and, and Carolina had Michael Jordan and James Worthy. And that game, as much as any, led to the shot clock. And Dean always wanted a shot clock because he thought a fast-paced game would benefit him because he always had more talent. So that was, that was the irony of it. The other thing is he also decided to hold the ball in a game against Duke in 1979, and, and Carolina broke a record that will never be broken. It may be tied in that game because they scored zero points in the first half. It was 7 nothing at halftime, and they didn't hit a rim and th the rim, and that was the first night I ever heard an air ball chant because Carolina shot three air balls in the first half. So, anybody else? Yes, sir. What do I think about Mark Turgeon in Maryland? I think Mark Turgeon's a good coach. Um, I think it took him a while. I think they made some real recruiting mistakes early, overrated some of their players. You might remember Shaquille Clear was going to be the next Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, he's, not, he's not even Casey in the Sundance Band, or whatever they were called. Um, but I hope Melo Trimble comes back for Melo Trimble's sake more than for Maryland's sake, because he needs another year of college. I think it's worth remembering they've won 55 games.
the last two years. And most coaches don't make their big move until their fifth or sixth year. This will be Mark's sixth year, I think, coming up next year. So I, I, would, I, would, I would stick with him. I think he's a very good coach and a good guy. Yes, sir. Any golf books on the horizon? This is my agent, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> I'm working on a Ryder Cup book right now. Uh, it's on this coming year's Ryder Cup. It's kind of a good walk, spoiled type of book in terms of my reporting approach, and it'll be out the fall of next year. Yes, sir. Oh, boy, that's a, that's a trick question. Will Coach K retire before, excuse me, a D.C. sports team wins a championship? I'm going to say no. I think he's going to coach for another four or five years. And I think sometime here, if Mike Rizzo doesn't sit down his best players in October, um, or, uh, you know, really? How'd it work out? <laughs> um, uh, or, uh, or, although the team I would bet on first is the Caps. I really thought the Caps were going to do it this year because they had the best goalie. And Brayton Holpe, he's a great goalie, and he's going to be a great goalie for a while. So I think the Caps and the Nationals have a very good chance to win a title here in the next few years. Yes, sir. My pick for the U.S. Open in golf or tennis? <laughs> no. <laughs> I pick Oakmont. Um, the course will win. Uh, you know, asking somebody to pick one golfer, really, I mean, if I was that good, I wouldn't be standing here on a cold, rainy day talking to you people. I'd be on my island somewhere. Uh, but I, 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 I will say this. Um, I think that Ricky Fowler is due to play well in a major. He's played horribly in the majors the last couple of years. He's too good a player for that to continue. I would hope he'll play well. And Jordan Spieth will be back. No worries there. Yes, sir. Take two more. Oh, I got, oh, I got more time for questions. Okay, I, I got confused. We've got plenty of time. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Mm-hmm. Well, I do have a memory of the Knights of Columbus, but it's a little bit different. Um, when I was a senior in college, uh, people find this hard to believe. Duke was awful when I was in school, okay? Duke finished last in the ACC all four years I was an undergraduate. Last or tied for last. Think about that. They finished last once since then. In fact, in 1978, when Duke made the national championship game, the year after I graduated, the true story. Bill Foster was a Duke coach. He had a very dry sense of humor. And there, the Final Four was in St. Louis that year. <clears throat> and after the Friday practices, somebody said to him, Coach, a year ago you tied for last in the ACC. Now you're in the Final Four. What happened? And he just looked straight face and he said, well, John Feinstein graduated. And everybody's looking around the room going, who the hell is John Feinstein? I was the night police reporter for the Washington Post at the time. So, uh, but Duke was recruiting Gene Banks was the highest recruited player in the country at that time. And it was a, he had announced he was going to Duke. But in those days, you couldn't sign a letter of intent till April. So the Knights of Columbus was in March. And uh, on, a very, on a day like this, uh, I went to see West Philadelphia High School play against Georgetown Prep in the old D.C. Armory. And mostly to talk to Gene Banks because there were rumors going around that UCLA and Notre Dame were trying to get in late and recruit him. And so the game ends, and I go down to the basement, which is where the locker rooms were, and I talk to Gene Banks, and he goes, oh, no, I'm coming to Duke, absolutely coming to Duke. So I go back upstairs. Bob Wenzel, who was the assistant coach, who was babysitting Banks, because in those days there were no limits on how often you could see a player play. Gene Banks didn't go to the bathroom without a Duke coach being present as a senior. So Wenzel's standing up there. He goes, what did he say? I said, he said he's coming to Duke. A minute later, as Banks comes up the step, Steps, Digger Phelps comes out of the stands with Austin Carr, Sid Catlett, and Bob Whitmore, three great Notre Dame players, all from the D.C. area. And he walks over to Gene, hugs Gene, and he says, so Gene, you go to Duke, who are you going to be following there? You go to Notre Dame, this is who you're going to be following. I thought Wenzel was going to pass out. And so... You know, Gene talks to him for a few minutes, and he walks over to where Wenzel and I are standing, and he looks at me and goes, Coach, are you all right? And Wenzel goes, yeah, I'm fine, Gene. Why? He goes, because you're white as a sheet. And, of course, he did end up going to Duke. But that's my Knights of Columbus memory. I did not see John Thompson 
coach in the Knights of Columbus. Although, as I'm sure you know, since you're obviously a fan, he and St. Anthony's were involved in the single most famous high school game never played. In the old Jelliff League, anybody remember the Jelliff League? They played outdoors, Northwest D.C., rickety old baskets. All the best players played there. And DeMatha and St. Anthony's couldn't get it together to schedule a game. And now in the Jelliff League, they're supposed to play in the finals. And John Thompson said, if you won't play me in the winter, I won't play him in the summer. And he sent cheerleaders and football players to play in the game. And DeMatha won something like 160 to 50. So greatest high school game never played. There were 5,000 people there in a place that seated 1,500 to see that game. Never played. Anybody else? Yes, sir. You talking about a high school player? I'm a bad person to ask that at this point because I, I used to go to all the high school summer camps and I had firm opinions about high school kids. Now it, it's it's more on reputation than anything else. And half the time, you know, the kids who are rated the one, two, three, four players don't come close. I mean, the, the best example I can give is I remember, gosh, it's 20 years ago now. You remember a guy named Joey Beard played at, at South Lake, same high school as Grand Hill. He was the number six rated high school player in the country. Joe Smith was rated 124th. Okay, that's how much these guys know. So it's hard for me to... I could give you names. I can make up names. I'm not make up names. I can give you real names, but I never saw them play. So it's hard for me to say. Yes, sir. Who? Uh -huh. <laughs> Remind me, who was he? Um, I, my honest answer is I don't know because I don't know when he's going to play again, if he should play again, should play. He'll play. He'll try to play. But... You know, the, the old saying is, once you got a bad back, you got a bad back. And, uh, but the, other, the flip side is, you never count out the elite of the elite in any sport. You never say, you know, Jack Nicklaus won the Masters when he was 46. Arthur Ashe won Wimbledon when he was 35. Guys who are truly great do things they should not be able to do. And if anybody can do something that you should not be able to do, it's Tiger Woods. So I don't count him out. Yes, sir. Uh, well, it, it, it's funny because obviously all the focus was on what happened to Jordan Spieth, specifically on the 12th hole. I understand that. Uh, I was amazed, though, at the panic that, you know, he would probably never make another birdie because of that. Uh, and I think he's one shot out of the lead going into today in, in Dallas. Um, but the sad thing is when, when Greg Norman blew the six-shot lead in 1996, Nick Faldo made a comment afterwards. He shot a bogey-free 67. He said, I hope people will remember that I played pretty well today. Is this something I said? Um, and, and the same should be said of Danny Willett. He shot the exact same score as Faldo, bogey-free 67 to win. And what he did that really amazed me was he's walking off the 15th green, and he hears this gasp. And he turns around, and he sees speed 7 go up. Actually, what happened was the way it works on the scoreboard – there was a red five next to Spieth's name for being five under par through 11. And then next to the 12th hole, they put one because he quadruple bogey. And he said at first he thought it was, the guy had made a mistake. You know, he thought maybe Spieth made a hole in one and the guy should have put a seven up instead of a one. But then when he realized it was real, he was like, oh, my God, I'm leading the Masters. And a lot of guys at that moment can't handle it. He walked onto the 16th tee, hit as pure an eight iron as you'll ever see made the putt for birdie, and went on and won. I thought it was a great performance, and I hope people will give him credit for that great performance. Yes, sir. I don't share your, 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 your feeling. No, I thought it was fine. I, I, I thought it was fine. It's a great story. I, I don't know. If, if I had been producing it, which I wouldn't be because ESPN and I get along about as well as my ex-wife and I. Um, nah, I like her better. Um, for cr must be an ESPN train. Um, uh, they have all the money in the world, uh, although maybe not as much as they used to. 
uh, and they get all the access they want because they're ESPN. I thought they missed some major parts of the story, and I won't bore you. But, it, but the point is, somebody like you, I, I know stuff that you don't know because of what I do for a living, because I just wrote this damn book. Um, so, but it, for an average viewer, it's a great story. It's an amazing story. Um, I, I, I think they've done some very good 30 for 30s. This one was good. I also think they've done some very bad 30 for 30s. So, and I may have a little bias against ESPN. No, I have a lot of bias against ESPN. Uh, we've got time for a couple more. Yes, sir. What criticism? Um, okay, the question is, how do I handle criticism? Uh, part one. Uh, and the answer is, I get angry. Because they're always wrong. All right? Um, and, and the best example I can give you, I wrote a book called The Last Amateurs, which was about basketball in the Patriot League. And I, I, I basically said I wanted to write about kids who played strictly because they loved the game, knowing they weren't going to make a career, they weren't going to get rich playing basketball. There had been two NBA players who came out of Patriot League schools at that point. David Robinson, who played at Navy before it was in the Patriot League, and a kid named Donald Foyle, who had played at Colgate and only went to Colgate because his guardians were teachers there. So I wrote the book, and in the introduction to the book, I said that when I wrote my book on the ACC, eight, uh, four years earlier, I had been amazed how every player in the league was convinced he was going to play in the NBA. Every player in the league. And that that was all they were really trying to do. If they got a class in somewhere along the way, that was fine. And I said, the notable exception to this was Tim Duncan. Because Tim Duncan could have been the number one pick as a freshman, a sophomore, and a junior. Chose to go back to college each time because he liked college and because he had promised his mother who had passed away that he would graduate from college. I, that's in the introduction to the book. In the review of the book in the New York Times, the woman wrote, Mr. Feinstein completely ignores the story of Tim Duncan, da, da, da. What book was she reading? <laughs> Clearly not mine. So uh, any writer who tells you, oh, I don't pay attention to reviews is a flat out liar. And the, the fact that the reviews on this book have been so great make me extremely happy. I, f I say, oh, finally, they got it right. Um, <laughs> but I've been very lucky, though, all kidding aside, that my, review, my books have been overwhelmingly reviewed very well. That's why I, probably part of the reason I get to keep writing them. But I still get annoyed. And yeah, I guess people have called me at times to complain, um, but not too, too often, um, not very much. I can't remember a specific story. Let me get him back here. I'm going to take you, sir, you, sir, and you, sir, and then we'll be done. Yes, sir. What will the NCAA do about UNC? Sylvia Hatchell's going down. Okay, I, I say that. There, I think that they're going to nail the women's program. They're going to let the men off with a wrist slap. And what they're going to say is that because there were non-athletes involved in this, which there were, that you can't just nail the football team or the basketball team um, and I, I think, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say, we're putting you on probation for three years. That's meaningless. Probation means you better not do that again or I'm going to get mad. Uh, sanctions are what are meaningful. They might take a scholarship away. Roy might get suspended for nine games like next year, but I think it's going to be very mild. Uh, yes, sir. Hockey. Hockey. I'm a huge hockey fan. I'm a long-suffering Islander fan, although we had some good moments in the 80s, many good moments in the 80s. Not so much the last 23 years, although we won a series this year. That's progress. Um, but I always wanted to write a hockey book. Actually, I wanted to do a book several years ago on the rivalry between Crosby and Ovechkin. But it's never, you know, it was right after that 09 series. I couldn't get the cooperation. I needed more from Crosby than the Ovechkin people. Uh, but I always know that if I ever get to write it, I'll call the book Season on the Rink. <laughs> and I've already got the title. Uh, last one right here. All right. Um, I'm glad you asked that question, actually. That's a good way to end. Um, it, it, how long it takes me to write a book depends on the book. It depends on whether... It, I'm tied to a specific event like a Ryder Cup. Obviously, I want the Ryder Cup book to come out within a year of that Ryder Cup being played. 
this book didn't have that kind of time pressure. And, but I didn't need all that much time to report it because I'd lived it, as I said. I still, because I'm a hoarder, much to my wife's dismay, I still had notes and tapes from all my conversations through the years with all three of the guys, thank God on Jim and Dean. Uh, I was lucky that the wives were as cooperative as they were, Linnea Smith and Pam Valvano, since I couldn't talk to, to Jim or, or Dean. But um, so, and the way I get my ideas is completely random. There, there's, I, I tell the story in this book in the introduction of how this book came about. I was at a dinner here in Washington three years ago when Mike Krzyzewski was being given his one millionth coaching award for something. And I was supposed to introduce Mike and we were sitting at dinner together and this was right after he had just seen Dean, the, what I described, the, the, their last meeting. And he, he, he was telling me about it, and he was getting very emotional talking about it. In fact, he was tearing up. And I started thinking how remarkable it was how their relationships had, the relationship had changed from beginning to end. And then he started talking about Valvano and how, because I had commented, Mike, when he first came in the ACC, was maybe the worst public speaker I've ever seen. I mean, he was horrible. And now he's one of the best. He's not Valvano. Nobody's ever been Valvano. Valvano and David Faraday are the two best public speakers I've ever seen. But Mike's not that far behind. And he was telling me how it was Jim who encouraged him to work to become a better public speaker. Because he said, look, you're smart, you're funny, you know how to tell a story. If you work at it a little, you'll get good at it. And I asked him at that moment, I said, if Jim was here today and he saw everything that you've become, what would he say? And he thought a long time, and he got teary-eyed again, and he said, he'd say, I told you so, which is great. And as I was driving home that night, I thought, I knew all these guys better than anybody in the media ever did. I, I will say that without any fear of being immodest. I spent hours and hours with Mike, hours and hours with Jim, spent more time with Dean than anybody in the media ever did. And I said, this is a book I should do. And, and the, the irony is that, when, to drop a name, when Bob Costas read the book, he called me and he said, the only thing I thought of as I finished the book was, what took you so long? So it took that night and Mike kind of tripping my memory. So there's, there's, there's no pattern to it is the answer, but sometimes you get lucky. Thank you all very much. Thanks for coming out today.